Good morning and happy Mother's Day to everyone. It's a great uh, blessing to get to worship with you all today, both those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary, but also uh, those of you who are worshiping with us at home. I'm going to start with a, a brief reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to be talking a little bit later about uh, this idea that we see throughout Scripture, this idea we see throughout the story that the Bible tells of, of God as a shepherd uh, and, and God as a good shepherd and, and all the ways that this good shepherd provides and, and nurtures and, and cares for his children. Um, and, and one of the ways that God does that in our lives, one of the ways that so many of us are, are blessed uh, by the hand of the good shepherd is um, he, he places mothers in our lives. And certainly um, this is true for our earthly mothers, for um, the, the women who, who give birth to us and, and nurture us and raise us up uh, in, in their homes. Uh, but also in the kingdom of God, we're doubly blessed because as the psalmist says elsewhere, the, the Lord places the lonely in families. The Lord adopts us into his family. And part of that is he, he provides us with all kinds of mothers, with, with women um, in the church, with women in his kingdom who, who contribute and, and nurture and, and provide uh, good things from, from, the king, from the kingdom of God in so many ways. And um, so today on Mother's Day, as, even as we honor our, our earthly mothers, we also, we also just want to make sure that we honor all the women in our lives whom, whom God has, has raised up to care for us and to guide us and to teach us and to nurture us. Um, and as I said, it's, it's a blessing to get to, to come together with you all this morning and, and worship a God who provides, a God who cares for us, a God who nurtures us in so many ways, and also to honor the women that he's placed in our lives and in our church to, to, to carry out his work in those ways. And so um, at the end of service today, uh, we have some gifts for, for all the ladies in the church. Um, so make sure you, you, uh, you, you grab one of those on your way out. And as we worship together, Let's worship uh, our, our God who is a good shepherd, a God who cares for his children, a God who leads his, his children like a flock. And let's give thanks to that God who in so many ways nurtures and cares for those he loves. of the earth from the depths of the sea from the depths of the sea from the heights of the heaven the heights of heaven your name be praised from the hearts of the weak the hearts of the weak from the shouts of the strong So 
And I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory And oh, victory morning scripture comes from the book of James chapter 1 verses 16 to 18. Don't be deceived my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. You may be seated.
As we pray this morning, part of the prayer will be for mothers, and some of those prayers are kind of a compilation of a number of prayers I found. Please play, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with worship and praise. With the greening of spring, we stand in awe of the beauty that is all around us here. Please give us the heart and wisdom to be stewards of your creation. Never let us forget that everything belongs to you. And dear Lord, we confess our sins to you. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We often take matters into our own hands instead of asking for your direction. We worry when you tell us, do not worry. Though unworthy, we ask you to please forgive us and to lead and guide us to do your will. We pray for our friends and loved ones. We thank you for those you've restored to health, and, and we pray for those who need your continued hand of healing, comfort, and support. We trust you to meet our needs. We pray for our broken world. Help us find paths to peace where the wars are, and safety for the refugees. Help us find common ground in religious and political strife. Send healing and cures for disease and rescue for the natural disasters. Help us to do your will to reduce this suffering. You are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. We pray, too, for the missions that our church supports. Today, we especially pray for Family Promise. Lord, please bless them as they provide shelter and support to homeless families. And we ask your blessing on all the graduates who have reached this special milestone and all those in their lives that help guide them to this time. Keep them, Lord, on the path they should go. And on this special day, Lord, thank you for all mothers, for the new ones who endure sleepless nights with infants in their arms, for the busy ones who juggle the pressures of work and home and family life, for the steadfast ones who nurture and care for our special vulnerable children, 
for the patient ones who always seek to forgive and engage with their preteens, for the persistent ones who find new ways to connect with their many adults, and for the single moms and their unrelentless struggle uh, as they hold things together. We thank you, too, for those who stand in for mothers, grandmothers and sisters and aunts and foster moms and stepmoms and dads, spiritual teachers, school teachers, and any and all family members and friends. And dear Lord, send your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to all mothers who sorrow for children that have died, are ill, or estranged from their families, or who are in trouble or danger of any kind. Help grieving mothers to rely on your tender mercy and love. And we remember those who grieve the loss of their mothers and who hold and honor their memories dear. Send your Holy Spirit to comfort them. Bless all mothers whose shoulders we have cried on, whose wisdom and guidance we have relied on, and who have led us to you to walk by your side. And help us, Lord, to be more thoughtful of mothers. Help us to support them and keep them in our prayers. May you bless them now and forever. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As a number of us, whether, um, whether our mothers are still with us or whether we reflect back on the lives of our mothers and grandmothers, as, we, as we've been thinking probably over these last few days about what those lives look like, um, my guess is that, that one, of the, one of the things that we often will return to is the work that mothers do in preparation, right? Making preparations for, for meals or events or gatherings of different kinds. Um, that's, that's a work that very often falls on the shoulders of mothers, of, of women um, in homes and in communities. And if you don't believe that, just take a look at how many, uh, how long the lines are at restaurants today. It's, it's maybe the biggest day for eating out because it's the day when, um, in so many cases, uh, the, the work doesn't fall necessarily on, on the mothers uh, to take care of a meal or to take care of a gathering. Um, and this is something that's been true really throughout history. If you look, if you look at scripture and um, so many of the, the days of preparation for special feasts for the community or for the Sabbath, so much of that work was often done by mothers, by women, by, by the faithful women of the community. And that includes the work of preparing a table. The, the psalm that we just read uh, a, f- a few minutes ago, Psalm 23, talks about God preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Right? This work of preparing a table, um, however mundane it might seem, is an important work. It's, it, it's meant to signify in the psalm and, and in our lives, it's meant to signify comfort, nourishment, uh, a safe place where people can gather, even in the presence of enemies, even in the presence of struggles, even in the presence of hardships. So when the psalmist says in Psalm 23 that God has prepared a table for me, a table for us, in the presence of our enemies, that, that's supposed to carry with it all those connotations of, of care and nourishment and, and even shelter and safety and security. Fast forward several centuries where Jesus gathers at a table with his followers, and he also talks about preparation, right? He talks about, I go to prepare a place for you so that you may be with me where I am. The disciples didn't quite understand what he was talking about later as they reflected on it and as we reflect on it. We realize that, that Jesus is doing that work of preparation for the heavenly banquet when we'll all gather around the table in the kingdom of our God, when we'll all gather around for the, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb and we will, we will feast forever on God's goodness, on God's grace. Um, Jesus has gone to prepare that place for us. He's gone to prepare that table for us. But that's not all, right? Because as Jesus gathered with his disciples, as he spoke those words, he was sitting at a literal table, a table that he and, and he had delegated some of this authority, but he had, he had made preparations to eat the feast with his disciples. And as part of that feast, 
he prepares another kind of table, a table of the new covenant. He takes bread and he takes the wine and, and he, he tells the disciples that this table, this celebration, this commemoration is going to, to point forward to what I'm about to do, to, 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 the, to the laying down of my life, to the, the pouring out of my grace, the pouring out of my goodness for, for the salvation of, of, of all who, who find refuge in me. And so Jesus prepares a table. He prepares a table for his disciples. He goes to prepare a table for all of us uh, in his Father's kingdom. And in the meantime, we gather around this table that he has prepared for us. Uh, we, we break the bread. We drink the cup. And in doing so, we honor this gift that he has made, this gift of, of, of sacrifice, this gift of giving his life, but also this gift of, of preparation, this gift of making all things ready that we might enter into his Father's kingdom. So as we gather today at the table, let's give thanks for the, the, the ways that, that, that God, our, our good shepherd, the ways that Jesus, our good shepherd, has made everything ready, has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies, in, in the presence of our struggles, but a table that points forward to that eternal table where we will gather with him. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure, and how great the pain of searing loss, the father turns his face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulder pray. God, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, we, we always thank you for every day of life you give us. But God, especially we thank you uh, for this day that we can come and gather and to worship you. God, we praise you for these times that we have. God, 
especially these times we can come together and remember your son. Here in a moment, we'll eat a piece of bread, we'll drink some juice, and we'll remember the body and the blood of your son. We do so with joy and thank, thankfulness. God, we're filled with joy uh, because the Creator loves us so much uh, that He desires a relationship with us. You desire uh, for us to be with you. God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the hope uh, that he gives us. So God, as, as we remember him at this time, we pray that we would uh, just allow you to continue to transform us, that we would always continue to seek to, to mold our lives uh, to look more and more like Jesus, that we would reflect him in our lives uh, to everyone around us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. night he was betrayed, Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. He took the bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. supper, Jesus took the cup, he poured it, and said, this is, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. God, you have always been a, a good and generous God. You've always sought to give good gifts to your children, to lead us uh, in the right paths. God, all that we have comes from you, and we thank you for the abundance you have given us, not in just maybe resources, but our intellect, our wisdom our strength. God, at this time, we wish to give a portion of that back to you. Uh, we wish to give to you, uh, out of a place of love, uh, a portion of our monies. God, we always also want to give to you uh, throughout this week uh, whatever we have to give, however we can serve, whether we use our talents or our time um, or the things that we have. We do all this because of love uh, for you and what you have done for us, and we thank you. Amen.
As the kids make their way down to Children's Church, we are going to be reading together from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 1 through um, 18. So let's listen to God's word together. Sorry, 1 through 15, sorry. (laughs) I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for the ways that your word speaks to us. Through all these centuries, through all these generations, you continue to reveal to us who you are and who you've called us to be. And so, God, we pray that as we spend some time reflecting on these words from your son, Jesus, that you would um, give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you, the hearts and minds that would receive what, what you have to say to us. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. A couple of days ago, I got the chance to go on a field trip with Ethan's class to Rocky Mount, a historic site on the the Sullivan-Washington County line where visitors are invited to to step back in time and interact with the sights and sounds of the 18th century. Overall, it it was a pretty fun outing. Predictably, there were some elements of our visit that made more of an impression on a busload of third graders than others did. Unsurprisingly, the high point of the day for most of the kids came as we were preparing to leave and we made our way out to the sheep pens to meet the newest member of the flock, a lamb that was only a week old. As the kids lined up to pet the lamb, the joy on their faces made it clear that this was not an everyday event. While some of them probably get the opportunity to to interact with farm animals on a regular basis, or at least from time to time, Most of these kids were experiencing this encounter, as I suspect most of us would, as an oddity, as a special occasion, rather than as part of the fabric of their everyday lives. Outside of visits to places like Rocky Mount, or my occasional trip to the county fair, or the encounters I've had in in villages on, on mission trips to other countries, I'm right there with them. I haven't spent much time around sheep. The business of shepherding is not something that I think about much as a literal, concrete reality. And maybe some of you are in the same boat. I suspect most of us in the modern Western world are in this position. But it's important to acknowledge that that this makes us something of a historical anomaly. Throughout most of the time that, that human beings have occupied this planet, shepherding has been a constant, present fact of existence. It's often said that shepherding is among the world's oldest occupations, certainly around the same time that that people first learned to to cultivate the soil and plant crops. They also learned how to breed animals. And in the Mesopotamian region where these pursuits first developed, sheep were one of the go-to species that people first bred for meat and more commonly for wool. So maybe that's why shepherds play such an outsized role in the biblical story. Maybe it's why the image of the shepherd is such a fundamental part of our understanding of who God is and also of of what it means to be God's people. 
If you're like me, shepherds probably do loom large in your earliest memories of the faith. Maybe this is because you dressed up in a bathrobe to play a shepherd in a church Christmas program at one point. Or maybe because you gravitated, like I did, to the story of David and Goliath in the children's Bible, where a shepherd with a slingshot is able to take down a mighty warrior. Whatever the reason, I'm willing to bet that some picture of a shepherd is implanted on your religious imagination and has been from your earliest days. Well, the same is true of our ancestors in the faith, the Israelites, who even if they weren't shepherds themselves, came from a long line of shepherds. Abraham was a shepherd, as were his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. When the family of Jacob settled in Egypt, it was their status as shepherds that set them apart. And, and, and years later, when Moses was exiled from Egypt, he worked as a shepherd. He followed a flock through the wilderness around Midian for 40 years before returning to liberate the Hebrews and herd them through that same territory en route to the promised land. And of course, David. David was the youngest son of a shepherding family. He was charged with the, the difficult and often dangerous work of abiding with the flocks out in the field. And David learned a lot about what it meant to be a leader, and maybe more importantly, what it meant to be a follower from his apprenticeship in the family business. And so it's not hard to see why in the imagination of the covenant people of God, there are these images of sheep and shepherds that become central to their worship and their identity and their calling. But of all the statements, of all the stories, of all the depictions of shepherds, both literal and figurative, that we find scattered throughout Scripture, there are maybe none as powerful as the two that we've read today. The first, attributed to David, comes from Psalm 23, where he declares in a moment shot through with affection, with dependency, with simple trust, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And the statement uttered by Jesus, the son of David centuries later, I am the good shepherd. Now these assertions and the context surrounding them teach us something about what a shepherd can be and, and what a shepherd should be. But more importantly, they teach us so much about who God is and about who we are. So today I just want us to spend a little bit of, of time reflecting on these images of good shepherds. How they might shape us even in a world where we're more likely to encounter sheep in a petting zoo than as part of our everyday reality. So the first thing we see in this biblical vision of shepherding is that this work is a work of caring provision. Among the most famous words in the 23rd Psalm are the four that in the King James Version close out verse 1. I shall not want. When David, the shepherd turned king, wrote these words, he was surely thinking about all the times that his lambs had been hungry and thirsty and had looked to him for their needs. But he was also certainly thinking about the times that he had been on the run, sleeping in caves, out in the open, cold, hungry, thirsty, and at least a little bit scared. All those times when, as an exile, he wondered where his next meal would come from, when he wondered if he would even make it through the day. And in those times, God had provided what he needed. God had brought him through those difficult times, and ultimately he had placed him on the throne of Israel. Now, of course, this was a theme familiar to the Israelites. They had wandered like sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. They had been dependent on the hand of God to provide them with manna and quail, to, to bring forth water from the rock, to give them what they needed, not just to survive each day, but ultimately to make it to a land flowing with milk and honey, where God would continue providing the good things they needed. When Jesus takes up this image of the shepherd, and he applies it to himself. His, his followers would have undoubtedly seen this resonance, the, the parallels between a shepherd who provides what his flock needs and a Messiah who at every turn addressed the needs of the people who sought him out. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus applying his miraculous power to the people's physical needs. He heals the lame. He, he gives sight to the blind. He changes water to wine. He multiplies the loaves and fishes. We also see Jesus addressing their spiritual needs, driving out demons, touching the lives of outcasts with kindness, unpacking truths about the kingdom of God in his teaching. And whether they knew it or not, or whether the people understood it or not, Jesus came to give them what they needed most, salvation, forgiveness, wholeness, 
reconciliation. To put it most simply, he came to give them life. Unlike the thief, this false shepherd who comes to manipulate the sheep and to deceive the sheep and ultimately to destroy the sheep, the good shepherd, Jesus, comes so that the sheep might have life and might have it to the fullest. Now, all of us, like sheep, can sometimes be confused about what that abundance might look like. We've been conditioned to think that our wants or our desires are the things that will provide life to the fullest. But our shepherd, in his wisdom, doesn't always give us those things. So the provision that we see here goes well beyond the things that we want or the things we desire. Sometimes the shepherd will give us what we don't know we need or what we don't think we need. Of all the things that a shepherd provides for his sheep, one of the most important and frankly one of the most needful things is loving guidance. The shepherd guides the sheep to where they need to be. He leads me beside still waters, Psalm 23 says. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When Jesus speaks about the role of the shepherd in John chapter 10, he makes a point to say that the shepherd calls the sheep by name and leads them out through the gate. This is significant when we're thinking about loving guidance. He calls them by name. The other day at Rocky Mount, one of the things the kids were most interested in was what all the sheep's names were. And the tour guide had to admit that she didn't know. The sheep had names, she said, but she simply didn't remember all 20 or 30 of them. She only knew the names of the two lambs that had been born most recently. That's understandable. Even if she could memorize a list, sheep are hard to tell apart. And what's more, the sheep didn't belong to her. She was an employee. But the relationship that Jesus talks about here is different. The shepherd calls each of the sheep by name and leads them out. The sheep follow him. They obey him. They trust him because they sense that he cares about them. They won't follow a stranger, Jesus says. They'll run away from him because they don't recognize his voice. As our shepherd, Jesus exists in a relationship of loving guidance with us. When he teaches us in parables about the kingdom, when he calls us to a new way of life rooted in mercy and forgiveness, in truth and grace, we can follow him. Not because we fear him, but because we love him. Because he first loved us. When Jesus calls us to obedience, when Jesus points us in the direction that we should go, when he shows us how to live, it's not because he wants to punish us. It's not because he doesn't want us to flourish. A good shepherd wants his sheep to thrive. And Jesus is no different. But that doesn't mean we'll always listen. Left to our own devices, sheep will notoriously get themselves into a lot of trouble. Like any creature, sheep will wander off for any number of reasons, ranging from curiosity to foolishness. But uh, according to the experts, and here I, I checked a very reputable site, SavvyFarmLife.com, uh, the number one reason why sheep will wander off is fear. They'll sense that some danger is approaching, and in order to get away, they'll just run wherever they can, wherever seems right, whether they're actually running to safety or, more likely, making themselves more vulnerable by breaking apart from the flock, by going out on their own. I think we can sympathize. There might be any number of reasons why we stray, why we wander from these paths of righteousness that, that God wants us to walk. But usually it's fear. It's fear that we won't have enough, fear that we won't be enough, fear that we don't know, and fear of what we don't know, fear of what we can't see, fear that there are things that we could never hope to overcome on our own. And we run from these things. We run from fear, not realizing that staying where God has put us facing the situations God has placed us in, relying on God and on the, the other people, the other sheep that he has placed in our lives, resisting the temptation to strike out on our own towards what we think are greener pastures. This is actually the best course of action. We need a shepherd to provide loving guidance, to point us in the way we should go, even and especially when we're most afraid. And that brings us to the final aspect of the shepherd's job description that these passages mention here. Being a shepherd is about costly sacrifice. The good shepherd won't lead us anywhere that he's not willing to go himself. There is a peace that comes with being in the presence of a protective shepherd. The psalmist talks about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He talks about 
being in that place where fear should be the strongest, the place where he should be most overwhelmed. But he fears no evil because the good shepherd is with him. He talks about the shepherd preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies, anointing us with oil of refreshing when we are most anxious, giving us respite in the midst of the turmoil and troubles that would otherwise consume us. But this peace that the psalmist talks about, this protection, comes at a cost. Jesus highlights that cost in his own statements. He says that that when the shepherd has called his sheep, he goes on ahead of them. The shepherd ventures into treacherous territory, the, the sort of place where the sheep could never stand a chance without him. If it comes to it, Jesus says, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. David spoke to this when he told King Saul that he had stared down wolves and bears and lions for the sake of his flock. And of course, we know that Jesus would stare down enemies and terrors even stronger than that for the sake of God's wayward children. When Jesus says that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, he's not only pointing toward his own suffering on the cross, he's also highlighting the failures of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the other political and religious leaders of his day. They are not the shepherds of the people. They don't truly care for the sheep, certainly not to the point of making sacrifices for their well-being. Jesus is asserting that these, these leaders that he's talking about are more like hired hands who look to save their own skin whenever trouble threatens the flock. Jesus' indictment of these false shepherds should serve to remind us of our calling as well. As we read last week, when, when Jesus' ministry on, his er, on this earth was drawing to a close, as he was preparing to go back to the Father, one of the final commands that he issued to Peter was, take care of my sheep. The mission that Jesus gives us is shepherd's work. And this is true if you're a preacher, a minister, an elder, a deacon, someone who's filling some other sort of formal role in the church. But it's true for all followers of Jesus as well. To be a disciple of the good shepherd means that we should look for ways to shepherd others. We should look for ways to care for others, to extend mercy and grace and compassion to those who need it most, to provide loving guidance with our words and more importantly, with our examples, as we seek to walk in the way of Jesus. To be willing to make sacrifices for the sake of those this world so often leaves behind. I can assure you that the world around us is watching to see if we live into this calling. Our witness, the way we speak to the name of Christ, will be impacted, viewed through the lens of whether we, his followers, take this work seriously. If you've been following the news over the past week, you've certainly heard a lot about sort of the big, the big news, right? The, the potential reversal of Roe v. Wade, the, the 1973 Supreme Court decision that made abortion legal on a federal level. And you've probably seen a lot of opinions. You've probably seen a lot of takes on this issue, especially if you've been on social media. One of the most common arguments is that people who oppose abortion rights don't care about the women who struggle with these hard decisions, or they don't care about the children who will be born into difficult situations. You see this time and time again, this argument being, being trotted out. And this is an argument that goes beyond the political to the personal for me because of the context I grew up in. My mom ran a crisis pregnancy center in Louisville, and I spent a lot of time in and around that center as a kid. I saw a lot of the work that the staff and volunteers did to meet the needs of young women in heartbreaking situations. First, providing basic items like baby clothes and, and diapers and food, but then going beyond that to help these young women navigate a complex medical system, helping them pursue education, offering childcare on numerous occasions, taking women and babies into their homes. The work that these disciples of Jesus did was the work of shepherding, of caring for the vulnerable sheep of Jesus' flock. And I'm not saying that this has always been the response of the church to crisis pregnancies or to any other struggle that people face. It's sadly true that, that far too often those who profess to be believers have turned their backs. We've turned our backs on, on those facing crises of all kinds. But the kind of examples that I grew up with served to demonstrate to me what was possible when it comes to ministering to the vulnerable. I confess that I don't always live into this vision, but I continue to be challenged and inspired by it. And on Mother's Day, I think it's appropriate to mention that so many of these shepherds, so many of these followers of Jesus who were doing this good work were women. 
just as so many women continue to model caring provision and loving guidance and costly sacrifice in so many ways. I see it in the lives of so many women in this congregation, in the work you do as teachers, helping to educate the next generation with grace, or as social workers, helping families navigate heartbreaking situations, or in the medical field, treating illnesses and injuries and all sorts of traumas with courage and expertise, or in so many other fields, so many other ways that that you all serve our community. I also see it in the many ways that that the women of our church contribute to our life as a congregation, bringing their wisdom and insight to so much that happens here. And of course, in the home, so much shepherding is done by women who use the gifts that God has given them to help nurture and raise up families that know the love of God and the abundance of his kingdom. I could go on and on, but suffice to say that we can all learn a lot about shepherding from faithful women who take seriously Jesus' calling to follow him in this work in their homes and outside their homes, in the church and in the community. This work of caring provision, this work of loving guidance, this work of costly sacrifice. The calling that they follow is a calling for all of us. As we look to God to transform each of us from wayward sheep into those who can join our good shepherd in the work of his kingdom. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for all the examples of good shepherds that we see in our lives. People, men and women who go above and beyond the call to, in, in, in the call to, to, to nurture us, to guide us, to teach us, to make sacrifices for those around them, especially those who are most vulnerable. God, we thank you for the good shepherds that you raise up in your kingdom. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for the good shepherd your son Jesus, the one who sets the example of what it looks like to to care for those who are hurting, to lay down our lives for those who are struggling, to bring into the kingdom those who have strayed. God, we confess, as your word says, that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all wander off into all kinds of, of, of trouble and <laughs> and disobedience and danger on a regular basis. And we thank you, God, that, that you are uh, a loving God who, who knows us enough to call us by name, who knows us and loves us enough to, to use your rod and your staff to, to comfort us even as you bring us back into uh, the, the paths of righteousness that, that you call us to walk in. God, we know that, that like sheep, we, we stumble, we fall, we get scared. And we're thankful that we have a good shepherd. We're thankful that you, uh, you place good shepherds in our lives to help us see you and to, to help us know your grace and your goodness. Lord, give us ears to listen. Give us hearts that are, are open to that guidance. Every day of our lives, every step we take, that we might uh, be more and more drawn into your kingdom and into that love and that trust that you call us to have. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. We set aside some time each week uh, for invitation. Uh, And this is a time that we see throughout Scripture from the earliest days when God begins revealing himself to people in the Old Testament and certainly up into the New Testament in the period of the Gospels where where, where God is revealed in Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and the mission of Jesus. We see God calling people to follow him, God calling calling people to, to to. to to look to him as their shepherd, (laughs) to to look to him as the one who will lead them through this life. And people are given a chance. They're given an opportunity to respond. Um, And we set aside time for that opportunity as well um, as we encounter in the gospel this image of Jesus as a good shepherd, one who is willing to lay down his life for God's children that he loves. Um, That comes with an invitation to follow him. And if you haven't made that decision yet, this is a time when you can do that. You can confess the name of Christ. You can, you, can, uh, lift, you, 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 can, you can come forward. You can be baptized. And you can look to him to, to, to lay out the path that you want to walk on. It's also a time for, for those of you who have made that decision, but you're looking for a church family, um, a flock to, to be a part of. Um, we need each other. <laughs> Just as we need our good shepherd, we need each other to, to point the way to our good shepherd. And so 
uh, as we try to do that for one another, as we try to, to encourage one another and support one another and serve together, if you want to join us in that work, if you want to join us here at First Christian, you can do that. And then finally, it's just a time for those of you who need prayer. Uh, we all struggle with different things. We all, uh, we all need prayer. But if you want to come forward and share a particular need that you have, we would love to, to pray with you. And if any of this is tough to do in front of a group of people, I just ask that you talk to somebody before you leave. Let us pray for you. Let us pray with you. And let us see what God's doing in your life. But now as the worship team sings, let's stand and join them. If you have a decision to make, please come forward. Once again, it's, it's been a joy to get to worship with you all today, both those of you who are here in the sanctuary and also those of you who are worshiping with us at home. Uh, as In a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close in prayer, but, but before we do, just um, a couple of announcements. First of all, um, just a reminder uh, for all the ladies in the church, make sure you get uh, the, the gift that uh, should be out in the church lobby for you before you, before you leave. Um, and again, we're, we're so thankful for, for you all. We're so thankful for the ways that you, you give to this church, to to, to the community, to your families, all the different ways that, that you serve and that God has, has gifted you to serve. Um, on Wednesday night, uh, we're kind of in the, in the summer phase of our Wednesday night schedule, which means there's no action theater and no youth group, but we will still have adult Bible study at 6.30, so uh, plan on joining us for that if you can. Um, it's a great opportunity in the middle of the week to pray together, to, um, to, to just read some scripture together and, and discuss it, reflect on it. Um, and so join us at 6.30. We'll be back here in the, um, the adult Sunday school room, back here in the, in the hallway, um, 6.30 on Wednesday night. Are there any other announcements? All right. Well, um, let's close in prayer. God, we, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for all the ways that you have demonstrated yourself throughout history uh, and in our lives, that, that, that you are, you've demonstrated that, that you are a good shepherd. You have revealed yourself to be one who cares about us and loves us and walks with us uh, even through the valley of the shadow of death, even through the, the darkest and uh, scariest things that we face. And God, whatever we face this week as we go out into this world, we pray that we would lean on you. Uh, Lord, that we would, we would support one another and encourage one another. And God, that, that we would go out as, as missionaries, as ministers, as those who, even though we are sheep, we have also been called with the work to, to, to shepherd and to, to, uh, to bear the, uh, the good news of the Good Shepherd into this world, to, to model in our words and, and in our lives uh, what it looks like to, uh, to, to be loved by you and to share that love with others. Uh, God, be with us and, and walk with us 
Uh, it's in the name of your son, Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit that we pray all of these things. Amen. Go in peace.